I want you to stand with me as we read God's word. We won't read a lot of the, the word tonight. I want you to go to the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah, chapter 2. Recently preached a series out of this book. It's not a very long book. It's a familiar, popular story. If you've been in Sunday school for any length of time as a child, you heard this story. You heard the account of Jonah and the whale. In the book of Jonah, it's not referred to as a whale, but we know it was a whale because Jesus said it was a whale. Either way, it was a great fish. I like to catch one like that one time. Oh, well, I'm, I'm digressing. I've <laughs> Jonah chapter 2. I'm reading three words for my text tonight, and that's it. The first three words of Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed. Then Jonah prayed. Thank you. You can be seated. As I mentioned, the book of Jonah is not a very lengthy book at all, just four short chapters. One of two books in the Bible that ends with a question, and I dealt with that in another message. That's the problem with preaching a series out of a book. I don't want to preach all, all four messages out of, this, uh, out of this book tonight. But uh, it ends very oddly, but there's a reason why. But this, this story of, of Jonah, this book of Jonah, actually it's really not about Nineveh at all. It's about Jonah. And actually it's not about Jonah at all. It's about Nineveh. But really we can narrow it down to one word and that is forgiveness. Forgiveness. I would say even long-suffering would fit in there. How God was not only long-suffering and forgiving to the nation of Nineveh, but it was also long-suffering and forgiving to Jonah. This is a, a beautiful, a beautiful story, a beautiful account. And really, if I can share with you this illustration of what I think Jonah is all about. I... When I went to high school, I graduated in 1993, and back in that day, we, we didn't have whiteboards like they do now. We still had chalkboards. How many remember chalkboards? And I actually still had to, you know, clean the chalkboards and dust the erasers. That, I still did that. Those young people are like, what is a chalkboard? What is an eraser? Well, it's, we had those, and we liked it. <laughs> walked in the snow, uh, uphill both ways, you know. I'm just kidding. Amen. <laughs> but young people, you, you, you think you had it, have it tough. <laughs> you, 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 no. Try to go to school with no air conditioner or heater. Amen. Well, we actually had heaters. That's what we burn our crowns on, the little radiators yeah. in the uh, rooms. But anyway, I digress. So we, uh, I, I never did like math. I wasn't good at math. And Mr. Nora was my math teacher, a good math teacher. And, but I just didn't, I didn't understand it, I didn't grasp it, it, it just wasn't me. My dad, on the other hand, is, is loves stats, my nephew's that way, but I just hate, I just can't stand math. Can I be honest with you, the calculus algebra that I had to take in high school, I haven't used it one time since 1993. I just want to tell you that, kids, you got a lot of great things to look forward to in life. <clears throat> but I, uh, one thing about Mr. Knorr, on, on the occasion, we would, he would write down a problem on the board. And so it was, he would call us out you know, randomly to go up and complete the math problem in front of everybody. Now, some, there were some nerds that really enjoyed that. <laughs> you see, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not bitter at all. But anyway, I, I did not like that, and I knew it would always come down everyone got hit at least through the year at least twice so he would call me up and embarrassed I would try my best to you know fulfill the the equation and, and most of the time sometimes I'd get it right but most of the time I get it wrong but let me tell you what Mr. Nor did not do even though I got the problem wrong he didn't kick me out of class Ron, you know what he did? He gave me an eraser. Come on. And you know what he said? Try again. Amen. And I kept trying 
until I got it right. If we could open up the portals of heaven and kind of ask Jonah this question, Jonah, are you glad for an eraser? He would say, absolutely, I'm glad for an eraser. Jonah prayed here in chapter two. But I want you to notice, this is the first time we have record that he even prayed. There's a reason why he prayed, and we'll get to that here in just a second. But really, we miss the miracle of Jonah chapter two when you go back to the previous verse because it says the Lord had prepared a great fish. Do you not understand that if the Lord hadn't prepared a great fish, Jonah would have died in the sea? But before even Jonah was thrown overboard, God had already prepared a way that he would survive the sea. See, God's solution is always older than the problem. And before you even sinned, he already had a plan in store for you to be saved. Before you started this day, he knew that you would be here. He knew that you would hear a gospel message. He knew that you would hear some great singing. He knew that you would be in the presence of God. And he knew that you needed to hear what God has laid upon our heart tonight. God always has a solution before you ever get to the problem. This isn't the message, but before Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God had already had a plan. What was the plan? The plan was this, the lamb slain in the mind of God from the foundation of the world. God already had a plan, and his plan was that the coats of skin, that animals would be sacrificed, that it would cover their sin and cover their nakedness. God already had a plan. Aren't you thankful? God has a solution before the problem. God already had a solution for Jonah to save him out of the death of the sea. But it says then Jonah prayed. He wasn't in church. He wasn't in a Bible study. Probably we could say this was the worst place Jonah had ever been in his life. But he found the worst place to be in is the best place to pray in. Amen. And some of you owe me Some of us can say ouch to this. Sometimes the only time that God has ever heard us pray is when we get in trouble. I hope that your prayer life doesn't consist and doesn't happen whenever you're in tough situations. I hope daily in your life that you pray and not only ask him for help but also thank him for what he's done and who he is. But Jonah prayed. He was in the belly of this place, the belly of the well. And, 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 but the key word is then. Then Jonah prayed. Why did he pray then? He was in rebellion. He refused to follow the Lord's direction. We know that was in the first chapter. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city. I want you to preach. And we know Jonah was in direct rebellion and he went to Tarshish. And you'll notice any time you're in direct rebellion from God, you'll go down a road that you've never traveled before. The old saying is simply this, sin will take you farther than you wanted to go and leave you longer, than you wanted to stay and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. When you're in rebellion and disobedient to God, you'll go down a path and you'll shake your head and say, how did I get here? I'll tell you how, because you were disobedient and in rebellion to God's will. When you go against him, you'll go down. It says he went down from the presence of God to Joppa. He went down into the ship. In verse five, chapter one, he went down into the sides of the ship. So he went further, then he laid down and went fast asleep. Then he went down into the sea, down into the belly of the whale. I'm telling you, that's the direction you go when you're in rebellion from God. You'll go down. Sinner, friend, if you continue down that path, you'll go lower than you've ever wanted to go. There's the pits of hell that's waiting you if you don't ask God to forgive you of your sin. And we, we, we preachers, and we used to preach this bluntly and this boldly, and I think we've gotten away from it, but there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. As real as there's a heaven, there's a hell prepared, not for you. It wasn't destined for you to be there, but hell hath enlarged herself. Hell has made room for you if you don't turn back to God. He was in rebellion and he went down. His life got so low. 
Why was why it was so important then Jonah prayed? What was then? You know what then was? It was the breaking point. Amen. Jonah reached a breaking point and a turning point in his life Amen. that he had to make a decision. He had to make a choice. And really, if we narrow it down tonight, there, there's two kinds of people that are here in this crowd. There's people that are here because they love to be here. You want to be here. You love to worship God. You love to be around God's people. I'm a part of that crowd. But then there are people that are the lowest they've ever been. Every week we preach to people that are reaching a breaking point. They're reaching a turning point. They're in rebellion of God. They went down as far as they could ever go. Never thought they'd ever get to that place. And they're low and they need help. Jonah, like so many, had an arrogant, rebellious spirit. And God allowed him to reach a breaking point to break him. I'm not saying you're arrogant. I'm not saying you have an attitude like Jonah. But there are many people that do. See, he was so arrogant, he thought that Nineveh didn't need it because he, I don't want to get into it very much, but he didn't, he, this is Jonah's thinking, okay? Jonah, you know why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh? Because he knew God would save him. Amen. And he hated their guts. You're right, Amen. I, that's very, I'm very plain, but that's exactly what it is. I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing, that's the truth. He didn't like the fact that God was good to people that he couldn't stand. And that's why he didn't want to go. He was arrogant. And there's a time in our lives when we think we can do it ourselves and get out of the mess ourselves. We think that we're, you know, we'll never get to a place that we can't get out of ourselves. But friend, you're there. And I've met some people that they thought they could do it without God. And you know where they found themselves? in the middle of a fish. And I'm not wishing any bad on anybody, but you can't be in direct rebellion of God and let it go on for so, God won't let it go on for so long. You'll reach a breaking point. He'll allow things to happen in your, I'm not saying all sickness and all disease and all tragedy is because of sin, but sometimes God does allow those things to get us to reach a breaking point. And that's where Jonah was at. He was in the belly of this fish, this belly of this great fish, and he reached a breaking point. But let me show you what happened when he reached that breaking point. When he prayed, here's what happened. First of all, he refocused. He refocused. He looked back to what he had left. In verse four it says, then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Amen. He said this in the middle of a whale's belly. Amen. There isn't no windows in the sight of a fish, by the way. He was at a breaking point. He was in the middle of the whale's belly, but he had church on his mind. Listen to me. The thing he ran from, he finally realized he needed to run to. He reached a breaking point, just like the, the prodigal son that was eating of the husk of the pigs and in the swine and with the mud and the muck and the mire. He shook himself and he came to himself and said, the servants in my father's house have bread enough and to spare. He reached a breaking point. He left exactly what he needed. And so many people that I've talked to that have once knew the presence of God and run away or ne never even been saved but ran from the presence of God just like Jonah. And when you finally get to that victory point and that breaking point, you said, I don't know why I left. I don't know why I ran away. Everything I needed was right here in front of me. Jonah refocused. He remembered the presence of God. He remembered how good it felt. He remembered what it meant to be free. I think one of the greatest, one of the greatest torments and tortures of hell is that you'll have a memory that you've never had before. You think 
that you, you can remember things well right now, you wait till you get to hell. Because if you continue in the rebellion that you're in, you'll remember every song that's ever been sung. You'll remember every sermon that's ever been preached. You'll remember every one that, that came to you and said you need to give your heart to God. You'll remember the presence of God. You'll remember what it was. you remember what you had, but you can never go back to that. Friend, while you're still breathing, while you're alive and while you're here this evening, uh, listen, now's the time to turn back to God. Now's the time to repent. Now's the time to refocus. Come back to what you left. And can I, can I tell you this? According to Jonah chapter three, God allows leftovers. God allows redos. Cause he came and spoke to Jonah the second time. I used to say God is a God of second chances, but I've stopped saying that because some of y'all ran out of second chances a long time ago. He's the third God of the third, fourth, and fifth. So what I say now, he's the God of another chance. It don't matter how many times. Listen, if you come back to him and you're repentant and you're sorry, thank God he will take you back and he's reaching out with open arms this evening, wanting to take you back. Refocus. Refocus. He got to that turning point. He prayed and he refocused. Secondly, he had revival. Look at what happened. In verse six, he says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. That was a very poetic way to say he was in the fish's guts. <laughs> he was looking through bars that were the ribs of the whale. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, yes. O oh Lord my God. Amen. That word corruption in the Hebrew means destruction. Jonah pictured himself as a dead man. Amen. But when he pictured himself as a dead man, he was able to have a revival in his soul. Amen. You say, how did he do that? Don't lose me here. At this point, this is where Jonah finally owns up that it's his fault Amen. where he's at. Amen. Now, I'm still preaching here. I need some help. Amen. From the beginning of time, from Adam and Eve, you know what, uh, you know what the world has done since Adam and Eve? done exactly what Adam and Eve did. Whenever God came to them and spoke, you know what they did? They took blame and they shoveled it on the other one. Adam said, it's the woman you gave me. Eve said, it's the snake. They wanted to blame somebody else for their own sin. I know it's deep tonight. I know it's quiet, but it always is when you're having surgery. But I feel the presence of God tonight. I feel God's touching somebody's heart. I'm telling you what. <laughs> Glory to God. Listen, if you want revival in your soul, you're gonna have to own up to the fact you're the reason why you're in the place you're in. It's not somebody else's fault, it's your sin. It's your sin that got you there. I can't stand the fact people get so super spiritual and it makes me sick. They blame the devil for everything that happens in their life. It ain't the devil's fault. Some of it is, but most of it ain't. Amen. Well, the devil caused my, my gas to go empty in my car. <laughs> Yet you pass three gas stations on your way to church. Amen. It ain't the devil's fault, it's your fault. You should have stopped and filled up. Amen. Somebody say amen, I'm busy amen. preaching. Amen. Well, the devil caused my tire to get flat because I picked up a nail. No, it ain't the devil's fault, it's the nail's fault. Those are called accidents. Those are called life. You give the devil way too much credit. Amen. Well, it's the way my parents raised me is why I'm this way. Well, it's, it's my teachers in college. It's my teachers in high school. It's my friends. They want to blame everybody else but themselves for their own sin. And if you truly, I'm preaching right now, if you truly want revival, if you truly want God to do something with your life, admit it and say, Lord, oh me, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. Yeah. 
And when the anointing and the presence of God shows up in your life, it'll do two things. It'll either expose you or it'll encourage you. It'll empower you or it will expose you. When you get close to God in the light of God, it exposes the sin in your heart. And listen, just like Moses, when the, when the burning bush was, was caught there in the, in the wilderness, uh, Moses said, I am unclean. Whenever Isaiah, in, in, in Isaiah chapter six, uh, whenever the glory filled the temple and whenever the glory, Shekinah glory of God filled the temple, he said, I am a man of unclean lips. When Jesus showed up with Peter, the apostle Peter said, I am unclean unclean. Listen, folks, when are we going to realize if we really want revival, we're the ones. It's our fault. You know why you can't have, you know why you can't have camp meetings? You know why you can't have revivals? It's our fault. It's our fault. The genera- my generation and younger, they're not committed. They want God to show up on their schedule. That's good preaching, Brian. It was his consequence. It was his choices that put him in the belly of the whale. And he owned up to it. And because of that, he got revival. You say, how do you know he got revival? Because that brings us to our third point, the rejoicing. And when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee into that holy temple. And in verse nine he says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. I'll remind you, he is not in the Shelby High School auditorium. He is not in the camp meeting. He is not in church. He is not in his war room at his house. He is in the middle of a whale's belly. And he says, I will offer a sacrifice with the voice of thanksgiving. Now, now we look at that word thanksgiving and and we just read over it. Oh yeah, he was thankful. No, it's, it's much deeper than that. The Hebrew meaning of that word thanksgiving actually means to extend hands while singing a song. So in the middle of the lowest point of his life, Jonah was able to lift his hands and sing a song unto God. Now you may realize this or not, but most most of the verses in Jonah chapter two, verses two through nine, are direct quotes from the book of Psalms. Jonah was quoting and saying song lyrics right in the middle of the whale's belly. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to be too gross tonight, but let, let's let's be transparent. In the middle of a whale's belly, is probably not the prettiest place in the world. Now, I'm thinking, I'm thinking scientifically now. You got digestive juices. I'm I'm painting a picture. You're getting it. (laughs) Jonah is in the middle of all that. What should have broken him? The belly should have broken him. The point he was at in his life should have broken him but he found a way at the lowest point of his life to lift his unworthy hands and give a sacrifice of praise. You say, Brian, I'm in the, I'm in the middle of a whale's belly right now in my life spiritually. How in the world am I gonna get out of it? I'll tell you how. Lift your hands. Praise him because what should have broken you has now gotten you to a place that you need to be. 
God has taken all that bad and worked it out for your good. You should have been dead. You should have still been incarcerated. You still should have been in a place where you couldn't find any help. But hallelujah, you're in the house of God tonight. I know this is a schoolhouse, but we have sanctified it to God's use. And you're here. What should have broken you hasn't broken you. You are here with the breath in your lungs. Turn to God. Turn back to him and give him a sacrifice of praise. <laughs> and get, look what happened. And the Lord spake into the fish. You thought I was going to leave this out, didn't you? And it vomited out Jonah up on the dry land. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he's pretty specific with what he did. Yep. You know what happened? What was holding Jonah got sick of him. And that, listen, it didn't happen until after he lifted his hands in praise. And after he lifted his hands in praise, what was holding him, let him go. Hallelujah, some of you get this tonight. Whatever's holding you and binding you, you want a surefire way to break the chains? Praise Jesus. Give him a sacrifice of praise. I'm thankful tonight. I was once in the belly of the whale, but hallelujah, he came by and pulled me up, saved me. Aren't you thankful God always has another chance? Trey and Whitney get a song. It's time for someone to pray. Then Jonah prayed. He reached a breaking point. Then he prayed. I don't care what kind of excuses the devil's telling you right now. What I've noticed is the devil will never tell people, don't get saved. He'll tell them, wait till tomorrow. Wait till another time. No, you're here. God is touching you. He is speaking to you, and now is the time for you to come. Amen. Why? Because you may not have another chance. Really, you may not have another chance. Amen. You thought you couldn't get into the place you're at now. Think about how much worse it'll be if you turn from God again. Listen, he isn't, he don't have to call you. He don't have to touch your heart. I still feel God. He don't have to touch your heart, but he has. You're in a place where you can turn to him. Now's the time. Come right now and give your heart to Jesus. Let's be standing. And as they sing, I'm gonna invite you. Come, come down to this altar. Come down to the front. Let's pray with you. Let's get victory in your soul.